Good morning and welcome to number six in our series of eight live webcasts for the Year of Natural Scotland. Um, I'm Ian Forsyth and today we're going to be covering walking tourism. But before I go any further, for those of you who have been with us before, apologies for repeating myself, but I know we've got a lot of new people in today. Um, if you want to contribute a question, you'll see that there's a chat box on my left hand side. Just type your question in there and hit enter and it will appear in the chat box. And please, if you want to tell us where you're watching from, that would be great too, because it's nice to build up a picture of where our audience is coming from. We've had over 250 bookings um, for today's webcast, so that's a fantastic number. Um, so let's get your questions rolling in. I've already got one or two on the screen in front of me, and I'll be feeding these through to our industry experts shortly. But before I do that, um, we just want to go over to uh, an interview that we recorded with Mark Crothall the Chief Executive of the Scottish Tourism Alliance. Mark's going to be talking about Scotland uh, Tourism Scotland 2020, uh, an important document for every tourism business, um, and it has some relevance particularly to the, to the walking tourism sector as well. So let's just go over and hear what Mark has to say. Hi, my name's Mark Crothall. I'm the Chief Executive of the Scottish Tourism Alliance. We're the industry body, the overarching industry body, who are here to help you facilitate and coordinate and deliver the Tourism Strategy 2020. As it says on the front page of this document, the, the future of our industry is in our hands. Tourism 2020 is just about that. The Scottish Tourism Alliance are here to facilitate and support in every way we can to help you, operators and industry, to maximise the growth to its full potential. There are seven big key messages that really drive out of this strategy document. First and foremost, we have to improve the quality, everything and at every stage of the customer journey. Secondly, as operators, we have to understand our markets and our visitors and adapt our product to suit their needs. The third point is we've got to focus on what is great and really distinctive in the regions that are about this country and how we can actually maximise them and use them as a basis for providing truly authentic, memorable experiences. The fourth point is that as operators and individuals, we have to trust one another, we have to collaborate together so that collectively we can provide that connection of experience and extend the customer's stay so that they go home and at no point of their journey or their stay in Scotland will they actually have an experience that gives them a reason to doubt about returning. We need to plan for sustainability. That's about serving wherever possible at all times, good food, local food, local drink, and providing great local hospitality. I touched on marketing. Marketing is about marketing why people should want to visit and come to your establishment or come to experience your activity. It's not about the what, it's the why that will make the difference. And last and most importantly, our strategy, what underpins it is leadership. And you, in your own areas of expertise, in your own small domains, whether it be a large hotel or a small B&B, or you are an activity provider, you have to foster that leadership. It's about growing your team for the future as well, leading by example and driving home what will be those truly memorable experiences for those who choose to visit Scotland in 2013 and beyond. Walking. Golf without the ball for me, really. Seven miles on a golf course is my average, uh, my average walk. But actually, Scotland offers more than just golf courses to walk around. Fantastic coastlines, great paths, beauty around through the hills and the woodlands. It's really a, a, an asset that we can naturally turn into an experience and one that's truly memorable. So take advantage of it. Encourage your uh, guests, have those walking maps available in, in your B&Bs and also have them, the trails made available through perhaps getting a ranger to uh, <coughs> recommend them to uh, recommend what trails to visit and what trails to go down at breakfast in the morning it's there for everyone it's something that everybody of every age can do whether it's together or whether it's on their own and if you actually just want to escape up into the hills and think about the future without having any disruptions then there's no place better than to do it in scotland today we'll take things at a more leisurely pace and let you find out how you can maximize quite simply walking tourism in scotland 
So, as Mark says, it might be about going out on the hills for a bit of peace and quiet, or it could be a family outing, or something a bit more energetic than that. But there's no doubt that walking in all its forms is fast becoming one of the most popular reasons for people coming to Scotland. Um, by 2015, for example, it's anticipated that walking will account for 22% of the revenue from all UK-based tourist visits. Um, so that's a significant chunk of income. With me today in the studio are a couple of people who know more than most about walking tourism. Uh, I'm just going to go over and introduce you to them just now. First of all, we've got Gary Hodg Hodgson from Tarmac and Mountaineering. Um, Gary's spent a lot of time all over the world walking, mountain climbing, um, but you're based in the Cairngorm National Park. Uh, tell us a bit more about your business, Gary. Hi, yeah, um, I'm now based in Aviemore. Um, I've been based in the Highlands for the last 20 years. Um, I've got a background with working with people uh, in the tourism sector of hostels, hotels, and the last 14 years I've been running my own business, um, guiding business. So I take out a variety of people from all walks of life, you can say. Um, and I, my uh, groups range from just easy strolls to hill walking, scrambling and winter skills courses uh, for the winter. And I also lead groups abroad, um, usually in the summer, July and August. Um, my main clientele um, is UK based. Um, the proportion is probably 70% UK, 30% right. international. Um, so that's a bit of Okay, all. that's great. We'll no doubt find more out find out about more about you as we go through the, the rest of the morning. But I'd also like to introduce our other guest who's Helen Webster of Walk Highlands. Um, I noticed on the high website, Helen, that it said that part of the planning for your business was actually during a, a four thousand mile hike with your husband. Um, tell us a bit more about what that planning's led us to. Um, what we do now is run Walk Highlands, which mm -hmm. is the busiest uh, walking website in the UK and what we do is sort of showcase the massive wonderful variety of walking that there is in Scotland and we link those people coming to the site to accommodation and activity providers so that they can book their holiday and plan their walking trip online. Right. Okay, and if, if I can just start with the first question for you, Helen. I, I also noticed that there was, you know, thirteen thousand visitors to your website a day. It's a phenomenal number. And um, what do you put the success of that down to? I think it's it, it's two things really. More and more people want to do things online, mm -hmm. and so that's where they're going to find information about walking routes, safety things, accommodation. So to package that together makes it very attractive. But what we can offer showcasing Scotland's walking is a massive variety of different types of walks, you know, wonderful coastal walks, wildlife watching spots, amazing hill walking that you really don't get elsewhere, you know, in Europe. So it's just, you know, we're really just feeding on the fantastic resources yeah. that there are in Scotland and mixing that with the technology that people now want to use and they want to share, you know, once they've done a hill walk, they want to post up a picture and say, you know, I went up this hill, it was fantastic, I stayed at this B&B, &B, they were brilliant, you know, and they want to share that with people, so to, we provide that opportunity. And it's just, you know, mixing the technology with the fantastic scenery and accommodation providers, activity providers that there are. And yeah. tapping into the demand for both, mm. obviously, with that. Yeah. So, I mean, in terms of communication methods that you, you both use to, to attract customers, what do you find tends to work best? I think, um, obviously, the last few years, um, internet, web-based, um, majority of my um, customers probably find me over the internet uh -huh. on my website. Um, when I first started uh, guiding, it was local hotels as our belief it's posters, and to a certain extent, that is how I still uh, operate. But majority is my web website. Do you have a feel for how big a majority that is that's coming from the website? Um, so um, when I actually meet my clients, uh, I will ask them, right. and um, the vast majority seem to be um, from internet it's websites. And also links to other sites like Walk Islands. Right. Um, there's a, a really good um, mountain forecast site, and that gets quite a lot of hits. So it's all linked together, which mm -hmm. is great. Uh, people networking. Right. Way to go. Right. 
what about yeah, you? Yeah, I'd reiterate that. People, uh, I think walkers particularly, are quite independent and quite able to plan their trip. So they will go to different websites and things, but what accommodation providers and activity providers can do is you know, signpost people and say, if you stay here, there is enough walking to do for a week or there's loads of opportunities and also signpost people to the mountain weather information service and all these other things but the key really is you know your own website and making sure people can find your website and that it's got enough information on it i mean other forms of communication facebook TripAdvisor, these things are all growing and becoming more important mm -hmm. um, and really replacing the the brochures and the, the more traditional ways that people used to look for information. I think that's slowly going out. It's still important for some sectors mm -hmm. of uh, people that are booking, but, you know, website really is the key these days. And social media part of that, then, yeah. obviously, from, from what you're saying. Yeah. What sorts of things are people talking about on social media in relation to walking? A lot of things. There's people sharing routes, so they're saying, you know, I, I went up this, this hill, this is the way I did it, these are pictures of my friends on top of the hill. Right. You know, that's the kind of thing they want to do. But they're also asking for where do I find a guide? Is this the sort of route I would need a guide for? Uh, where's a good... You're sharing pictures of wildlife. They're pretty much doing everything, arranging to meet up, talking about where they stayed. That's quite popular, you know. So they'll say, I found a fantastic B&B that, you know, was really helpful, that sort of thing. So if you can get those sort of recommendations online places where walkers are, are visiting online it's like gold dust really right so we'll get people talking about it mm. essentially i want to go over to one of the questions uh, one of the first questions from our audience to see there's a good healthy string of them coming in but we'll take one from tanya um, in caithness there are lots of areas to do walking but not sure if there are lots of documented and detailed walks to inform tourists of where there is to go um, do we really need that, or do people just like to find their own way? What's your experience with that? I think there's so many areas in, in the Highlands in Scotland where you can walk and wild. If people want the wilderness feel, that's where you've got to get it. Cape Ness is a perfect example. Um, and it's trying to get across to people that, because I'm based in Aviemore, it's a popular centre. We've got the Cairngorms National Park. Uh, I used to be based in Fort William. Ben Nevis is a big attraction there which is great, that you want people to gravitate to those main centres. But there's just a wealth of walking, climbing, um, all around the Highlands. And so when I take my clients out, um, if I'm taking up Ben Nevis or the Cairngorms, I will promote. Um, so I promote word the mouth, really, when I'm at it with my clients. Uh -huh. um, and that's the way to promote areas where people might not know. Right. Or they've heard about them. Don't know how to get there, like to know what the walking's like, what mm -hmm. the scenery's like. Um, and that's how I find the best way to promote those areas. There should be, I think, more documentation on right. the, and various, whatever that might be. Um, so would you say then that in general terms, people tend to be looking for some suggestions as opposed to, you know, this, this is where you should always walk or uh, what, 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 what do you, what's your experience with that? There's a mixture. The, the experienced hill walkers tend to be slightly more independent and they will probably, you know, seek advice from other people, look at some of the guidebooks and some of the routes online, and they're more likely to find their own way. For somewhere like Caithness and, and Sutherland as well, people might not see it as a walking destination, but it, there are a fantastic range of walks at all levels, you know, great coastal walking as well as a, the mountain walking. So for that, it's really a question of collating the information that's out there. There are quite a lot of walks online, in books, etc. But maybe signposting people and saying, there is enough to stay at my B&B for four days and have a fantastic walking experience. Maybe mix it up with a couple of other things. But you might need to help those people a bit more by suggesting itineraries, saying, you know, why not do this walk? And there's a great coffee shop halfway along, you know, to make a great day walk and there's a beach here, you know, helping people, signposting them, basically. Right. So as a general principle, having something there on your website, you're trying to w attract walkers saying, here are the good walks around about with tips, that's, yeah. that's the thing you would suggest? I think the other thing 
people can do if they're really keen is to maybe get involved with a local marketing group or the DMO or mm -hmm. community council and actually try and improve the walking infrastructure. So there's been a lot of work done across Scotland, particularly in, in the east, um, in the Cairngorms and at lower level walks, you know, people focusing on the community and shorter walks. So people could get involved in path maintenance or creating um, signed routes, the sort of routes that give people confidence and think there is a walk that I can do safely and there's no access problems. Um, so if people are really keen, they could get involved in that side of things. Right. And, um, you know, also people ought to know, if people are coming to stay with them, you should probably know what walks there are in your area, you know, even if you haven't walked them yourself, but to be aware of the range of walks. So you can say with confidence, this is a great little route for family, whatever, you know, uh -huh. just so you can be enthusiastic about it. So great idea to try yourself. Hmm. Yeah. We've got another question here, this time from Nigel. Um, and Nigel's talking about virtual routes. Uh, he said he's heard of virtual routes. Has anyone uh, any more information about them? He wants to set up a Sky to Creef Old Drovers route. Um, any advice for Nigel on that one? Yeah, I mean, some of those long distance routes are now gaining massive popularity. People are either doing them as a backpack, going from place to place, or they're doing bits of them as day walks. But certainly on the web, if you search for it, like that route originally, you know, was an old drover's route. People are talking about it on the web, you know. So yeah. if you went on and did a Google search, you'd be able to find other people who've done it, a bit of information, you know, it's all out there. It's not a signpost route, so that's why he's saying it's a virtual route. Right. You know, it's, it's in... It's on the ground, but yeah. not, not uh, signposted, and you know it's more of a challenge for people. To, mm. to but those it. sorts of things are, are, are quite popular with, mm. with certain groups of yeah. walkers, I take it. I think over the last, I've noticed the last um, five years, technology has really come into walking. Mm -hmm. um, just like the virtual routes, the GPS. Yeah. Um, people have got a really good idea even before I actually take them out. Right. Um, and so all this technology helps them in a way to uh, before they arrive in the area what they can expect mm -hmm. um, which is all great stuff um, so people are tending to research in advance which i suppose to some extent reinforces what you were saying about making sure you've got something on your own website if you want to appeal to walkers if there's things that they might find and that brings them to you yeah i yeah. think the other thing you could do is you know it, if someone's confirmed a booking, you can send an email out to them, maybe with a little bit of information about there were all these things to do, you know, including walks and mm -hmm. other things, and perhaps emphasising, you know, that you've got all the facilities that walkers would want, and then maybe, you know, people will stay for longer, they'll realise there's so much to do in each individual area. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. We're going to go over to uh, a short VT with Scott Armstrong in a second, but just before we do that, one more question from the, from the audience, uh, from Stephen and Fran. Um, we're looking to offer guided walks on our estate, nothing too technical, they emphasise. Um, do they need special licences or insurance or qualifications to be a guide? Is that something you... Um, <laughs> It's always, it's always a question um, as sort of bounded about within the guiding industry. Um, in the UK, there's no uh, legal requirement mm -hmm. to have formal qualifications. Um, the only um, legal requirement is that you're uh, a public liability insurance and a first aid qualification. Right. Um, slightly different in, in Europe. Uh, Whereas I've got a qualification to work in the Alps, say, right. where it's actually a legal requirement to be qualified yeah. for what you're doing, uh -huh. as in guided walking, or if you're an international climbing guide, mm -hmm. you'd have to be qualified for that. So the answer to this question is um, no. <laughs> what but about um, I think, from my experience, um, people will want two things, and I think for me, the most important thing is experience mm -hmm. and the qualifications. And I think that's what people search for when they're looking for a guide. So they want, they want people to know the area yeah. that you're working. But they also feel more comfortable, I think, especially nowadays, that you're qualified uh -huh. for what the activity that you're doing. Especially for children and families. Um, 
think it's a bit more reinsurance. Right. So your recommendation would be, although it's not a legal requirement, it's something that would make sense to pursue. Yeah, to, to, to so, yeah. Right. And okay. I think the way the way it's going is like I've said in Europe, it's a legal requirement, and maybe in ten years' time it will be in the UK. Right, but not currently. But not at the moment. Okay. Right. Well, thanks very much. I said just a second ago, we're going to go over to a short VT from Scott Armstrong, the director for Visit Scotland in the North. Uh, Scott's going to tell us a little bit more in terms of facts and figures around walking tourism. Walking tourism. Here are some key facts. Walking is the most common activity undertaken by visitors to Scotland. Over 2.2 million visitors on holiday from within the UK undertook a short walk in 2011, with 1.7 million undertaking a longer hike or ramble. In 2011, UK visitors undertaking short and long walks contributed £1,148 million to the economy. Walkers don't just walk, they also want to see and do other things, for example visit castles or places of interest, visit cities, view wildlife and visit distilleries. Visitors who are non-Scots are particularly interested in experiencing our unique culture and history as part of a walk and want to experience our way of life. Walkers want to be independent with easy access to information and options, are spontaneous and benefit from inspiration and encouragement. So as Scott said in his piece there, walkers don't come to Scotland just to walk, they want to do other things too. So just to you know, pick up on that, um, what links do you have to other tourism businesses? Because clearly people don't come and, and just walk and nothing else. There must be other things they want to do. Uh, what, what kind of links do you find yourselves building up? I think, I think um, the last few years people have um, changed their comfort levels. Uh -huh. um, people after a, a good day out on the hill want a little bit of comfort. Um, so hotel links being the guest houses. There are still people who want uh, cheaper accommodation. Mm -hmm. um, bunk houses, hostels, camping. Um, so there's a mixture. Uh, so I have a links to um, several um, accommodation. Um, links to weather sites, it's quite important. Um, people want to check the weather out. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they get last minute bookings and then people might just check the weather. Mm -hmm. So that's quite important. Um, I, I have a link to my own blog, <laughs> obviously. Right. Um, and it's especially important in the winter, is showing people up to date um, conditions on the mountain. Right. Especially for winter conditions for uh -huh. walking and climbing. So, so your, your clientele is fairly specialised in terms of, the, you know, they'll tend to come and it's, it's not, extreme's not the right word, but you know, that's, they're here to almost immerse themselves in that experience. I assume there are a lot of people who do walking, but not at that kind of adventurous level. What kind of things do they tend to be looking for? There, people are doing a lot of other things as well. So they'll come and they'll they'll be interested in photography and wildlife watching, maybe a bit of adventure sports. So they might go kayaking one day. Mountain biking is a big growth area, and you know particularly amongst say families and younger people. So they may bring their bikes with them or hire bikes, and it will be part of a holiday where they're also doing a fair bit of walking. Um, so. I think just to signpost those people to all the local activities and perhaps create packages as well is very popular for people visiting so they can easily find the guide or find the activity provider that's local and you know can hook up with them for a day, whatever. Um, we're sort of seeing a change, a little bit of a change. The hardened hill walkers will still come all year round, so they're a great target audience because they will stay during the winter etc but we're also seeing people coming and doing a bit of walking but they're, they're doing other things as well and it's you know you can't really portion them off and say well these are just walkers they won't be interested in other things they will the, the walkers will also take city breaks you know so they might stay in edinburgh two nights come up to the highlands mm -hmm. go to dumfries and galloway you know as part of a, a trip and i think the key is to to try to sell them the fact that there's enough walking and other activities in each locality for people to stay for a decent amount of time and to spend their money. There, so, you know. so it's a mixed package then, essentially. Mm -hmm. I suppose the converse of that is that if you're out there and you're involved in a tourism business that isn't directly involved in walking, then 
what you should really be doing is seeking out people like you who are involved in walking and start to build those links. Would that, that be fair, yeah? Yeah, I think we get a fair bit of feedback from people saying they're not quite sure where to find guides and do guides take people on lower activity walks, you know, uh, family orientated walks, that sort of thing, or wildlife watching, and that they want to be put in touch with people with local knowledge who can really enhance their holiday experience. So, you know, really, if you're an accommodation provider, I'd say make those links with, you know, people like Gary and other activity providers, and then it's easier for your clients and visitors to be able to, to do that during their holiday. You know? I, I think it's definitely important to have um, a strong link with your accommodation provider and to recommend each other. And yes. It's really good networking. Uh -huh. um, and also when people arrive, they like to have some ideas. Some people will come up to the Highlands and might not have any, any set plans. Yeah. So um, it's good to know that, uh, for example, the accommodation provider can let them know there's a walking guide available, there's his phone number, um, and explain a little about, about it maybe, right. and explain that um, there's someone available if you need it, yeah. wherever the activity yeah. may be. Okay. We've got, I want to, I'm conscious that we're getting a, you know, a fair pile of questions coming in here from the audience. So let's go back to some of the audience questions. We've got one from Charlene here. This might be one that Audrey wants to pick up on later on, but I'll ask you guys anyway. Um, how do we effectively measure the numbers of people using the routes? Who gathers them? Where are they published? And do we evaluate the impa economic impact in some way? To, um, sorry. <laughs> Um, for the most, the more popular areas, um, for example, Ben Nevis, um, it's quite well documented how many people go up and down the, the most easiest popular way mm -hmm. on Ben Nevis, for example, um, because there's actually infrared beams across right. the path right. in some areas, uh -huh. but they're more very popular areas. Um, so that gives you a gauge of where people are going in, in a popular tourist site, but obviously that's not always available. Right. Um, John Muir Trust sites is uh -huh. sometimes they, um, it's a conservation organisation. Right. So they monitor how many people are actually walking on the pass. Uh, for two reasons, it's for, for tourism, obviously, and also how much money they're going to spend on improvements to pass mm -hmm. or upgrading paths. Right. So that was a John Muir Trust? John Muir Trust. Right. And do they publish information on their website? Yes. Uh, yeah. All websites. Um, and they've got five areas in the Highlands where they manage um, the mountain, most of its mountainous areas. Right. Okay. There's a fair bit of information collected. So the national parks collect some information, the long distance routes, you know, like the West Highland Way, Speyside Way, they've got a fair good handle on how many people are doing those routes. But from our experience, you know, we publish over one and a half thousand routes at all levels and we find that all routes are being downloaded and are very popular. I mean so there are some honey spots that people have know about mm -hmm. and you know that those are the most popular and you know Ben Nevis is one of those but across the board you know short forestry walks, walks near urban centres certainly in the central belt we're seeing a lot of traffic to those walks so Basically, you know, any walk is becoming more popular. You know, people are doing more of the variety of walks, and there's, I think they're noticing that Scotland has this big variety, and that they can progress from shorter walks to, you know, a, a waterfall or something, and then they might start, you know, in years to come, they'll be starting doing the Munros or something. So, I don't think there's anyone collating all this information together. You know. Obviously, for erosion control and stuff, the national parks and the landowners are looking at that sort of thing. But whether there's somewhere, you know, mm -hmm. I don't think there's, there's not overall you're, you're, someone. I mean, we could certainly tell people 10 most popular walks, 10 most popular mm -hmm. hills, yeah. and, and the numbers of people that we think we're sending on those routes. Right, so. right. But there's not, not a central point where you can no. go to get all of that, that information. Another question here, this time from Ailey. Um, what is the viability of having a trail heading to John O'Groats linking with the Great Glen Way? Um, end to end, there must be a trifle disappointed after the West Highland Way and the Great Glen Way to then complete their journey walking up the A9. We have seen, I mean, I don't know if this is your experience, but 
a big increase in the number of people wanting to do long distance trails. And there's been a lot of work recently on improving the infrastructure for a certain number of more well-established routes. And coming off that, there's been quite a, a clamour for new routes to be developed heading up to the north, which is certainly an area, you know, where there, there aren't established routes on the ground, although a lot of the, the more independent backpackers and walkers are doing those routes and talking about them on the web. So certainly there's, there's a market for it. I think a lot of people doing the tougher walks like the Cape Roth Trail and, you know, possibility of a route heading up from Inverness to John O'Groats, which would certainly be popular, those independent walkers are planning their own route and you know, there's some debate as to whether they actually want, you know, a, a more organised um, route with infrastructure along the way. So I think it will probably happen in the long run, but there's quite a lot to be, you know, hurdles to get over, first of all. And we, it will always remain quite a wilderness challenging route. Yeah, there, there just seems to be um, people doing long distance routes the West Island Way, for example. Um, who maybe haven't got navigational skills, mm -hmm. so it's all well signposted. Um, accommodation is um, it's well catered for. So, th and there are many um, long distance routes mm -hmm. every year. It seems to be more and more. It's also a financial uh, thing. It's not just the fact of publishing that this is a long distance route. It's the infrastructure there. Yeah. Is there a, is the numbers there to do? Right. The people who want to do that. Yeah. So as I was saying, um, a lot of people are independent and they'll get a map, yeah. maybe, and devise their own routes. Uh -huh. um, and you can link quite a lot of well-established stalkers' paths, mm -hmm. uh, rights of way, roads, roads. Mm -hmm. um, for example, I've guided on uh, the Cape Raft Trail several times. Yeah. It's getting more and more popular, but it's not an official route as such. Right. So it's not signposted at all. Uh -huh. But there's uh, at least three guidebooks that will give you variations of the route. Uh -huh. um, so it's still fairly easy to do even if you're not particularly it's, it's, um It's a step up from um, several of the well-established long-distance routes. Um, maybe navigation, I'd say, needs to be a little bit more in tune than maybe the terrain. Um, if you don't mind a bit of bog, uh -huh. river crossing, <laughs> then that's fine. That's all part of walking. Uh -huh. um, I think that there's been some great community initiatives where, uh, for example, near where I stay, there's the Darva Way, which links Granton on Spey to Forest. And basically that was established by local people thinking, we want to bring walkers to this area where they're not coming at the moment. And they've you know, developed that route, built bridges, done a lot of hard work. And now it's quite a well-established route and they've got a walking festival that they've organised around it, you know, that showcases what walks there are in Murray. And, you know, there is opportunities, I think, for people, communities on route, you know, potential long distance routes to perhaps get together and see what needs to be done in way of infrastructure, see what the demand is and try and make it happen. Yeah. Okay, the next question we've got from the audience is a particularly interesting one because it's, it, I suppose it's people from outside the Highlands looking in and saying, you know, what can we learn? Um, Fiona's asked, Clyde Muirshield has 66 kilometres of trails and some walks on the Walk Highlands website, which is great, but we're not considered the Highlands. How do we promote central and southern Scotland to walkers? So it sounds like the Highlands maybe stole a little bit of a march here. What can we do to help the rest of the country? I think... Um there, there are many walks like in the central belt where um, it's signposted to um, and yet maybe it's a little bit neglected but um, there's plenty of information um, I think out there right. for walks that are closer to where the main population is. Um, when you say plenty of information out there, where should people look for Website, that? I'm sure. Um, I've never do, done it myself but if you Google um, Walk Central Belt, uh, uh -huh. Forth Valley. Uh, I'm sure there'll be something out there. For right. Some people, and which is great. You know, we were saying earlier on about technology. Uh -huh. um, it's so easy now to find out this information. Yeah. Um, it's helping. Uh, I think one of the keys is not to try and compete with. You know, you, you don't have the mountain splendor of certain parts of the Highlands, but there is a wealth of walking opportunities, 
and a wealth of people on the doorstep mm -hmm. to come out and do them. So it's really trying to find the unique selling point and saying, you know, at this nature reserve, you can see overwintering geese at this time of year. It's a fantastic spectacle. You can also do a walk that's buggy friendly, take your kids. You know, those sort of things that are maybe missing from some of the highland areas. And also putting together packages, so saying, you know, visit Stirling Castle, do this, do that, you know, have a day in Edinburgh. Or if you're in Glasgow, why not also get out, go to Pollock Park? You know, they're hugely popular, mm -hmm. these places. And there's been a lot of work done recently um, on improving the infrastructure, more signed walks, more leaflets, more on the web. So really people, you know, it's more a question of selling it to people, you know, and saying, this is what we've got here on our doorstep. Right. Come and explore. And I think Visit Scotland has done some quite good things with, you know, the Surprise Yourself campaign, actually saying, you know, there are some very surprising things on the doorstep of the big urban centres that people perhaps overlook in their rush to get, mm. you know, heading for the hills. I, I think it's a great way for people um, to get into more uh, adventurous walking. Mm -hmm. By doing walks like this, um, yeah. a lot of people take out on novices uh, in certain aspects. So, and just to keep fit, you know, if you live in the city, it's yeah. quite difficult um, to get in the Highlands every weekend, maybe. So, yeah. it's fantastic for that. It's a, it's a step up. Yeah. Um, but I think that that tip about you know looking for the USPs. What are the interesting things for people to you know, in your area and capitalise on those? Sounds like good advice. Got a great question here from uh, from Jennifer. How does an accommodation provider recognise the different types of walkers, i.e. the more independent to the less confident, so that they can know how to help them best? I assume they don't arrive with a sticker on their forehead, so we have to be a little little smarter than that. What, what's your tip and tips in terms of recognising people? I'd, I'd, I'd say most people would um, just by they'd ask questions first of all if they turn up at your hotel or B and B. Asking questions, where can I go? How do I get here? Do I need a map? I think a bit of common sense would say, uh, oh, maybe they haven't done a lot of walking because they're asking quite a lot of questions. Yeah. Whereas you might get someone who's who's a bit more experienced, and they'll just want to know um, the transport to the start of a walk, or um, they want to get a map, or they want to get some outdoor equipment, outdoor clothing. I think if people talk to each other, I think you gauge, I think, what, um, what level. Yeah. Right. I think what walkers want, you know, doesn't really alter that much between the different types of walker, really. Provision of a drying room, provision of an early breakfast if you're a and b or hotel, because particularly in the winter, the daylight hours are very short and... You know, if people want to get out, they might want an early breakfast. So it is talking to people beforehand, but the provision of information, if you can have a range of guidebooks, um, uh, maps, maybe print off the weather forecast to the avalanche forecast, those sort of things. Wi-Fi is becoming increasingly important because people are more, the more independent walkers will seek out the information themselves. They might be looking at Gary's blog, you know, for the... The conditions if they want to go mountaineering they might want to check the weather themselves and make their own plans uh, they might want to look at the stalking information that's available online they might want to look at routes and also if they come back to your accommodation and they have a fantastic welcome perhaps you've provided you know a nice hot drink and a cup of tea and if they've come back early wet and cold then they might want to share that on Facebook or on another social media site. If they've got Wi-Fi, they can do that straight away, and it's a huge selling point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. We're almost out of time. Um, there's a lot of questions that we haven't got round to, but one that I think is probably of general interest to, to many people who aren't directly involved in walking but want to see how they can make more of things. Um, is there a way to contact potential walking guides in different parts of Scotland? Is there a website, for example? It's Avril who is asking that question. Um, obviously, every most mountain guides, mountain leaders, um, they will have a website now. Um, Walk Island's website has got several mountain guides in all the different areas in the Highlands. Um, there is talk, and uh, Fort William 
as an example where I used to live, of setting up an uh, actual guiding office in the main street mm-hmm. so people can gravitate to it and get information as well as organise a guide, which is what you get in, in the Alps. In most, mm-hmm. even the smallest villages, mm-hmm. will have a mountain guide's office so people know and there will be a weather forecast there, um, equipment, advice. So I think that's the way to go if we can get um, in the major towns right. in the Highlands uh, a specific guiding office. Mm-hmm. People that's on the high street, and even if they're not thinking about a guide, they're walking up and down the high street, they might have just come for a, a holiday, and then they see, oh, there's a walking guide available. Oh, I'll go in there. Yeah. And it's the way to go. Um, okay. So it's not always about technology. Uh-huh. Um, Sometimes it's, they don't yeah. cash in. <laughs> Okay, well, thanks very much for your time to to both of you. I think that's been really, really good. We've got quite a lot of questions that we've not been able to answer. But thanks once again for your time. Uh, And also thank you very much for the questions that you've asked. Um, The whole purpose of these webcasts is really to look at how can you as a tourism business or someone involved in tourism (coughs) make the most of some of the opportunities that are around there, around the year of natural Scotland. Uh, And each week we've asked Audrey McLennan, the Senior Tourism Manager at Islands and Islands Enterprise, uh, just to round things off by saying a little bit about what specifically is out there in terms of the stuff that she's involved in and things that she knows about uh, that might be able to help you a little bit. So Audrey, welcome back again. Uh, I see that the cast's looking a little more elaborate than last week. (laughs) Hope the arms are are getting better. (coughs) We've heard a lot about walking today. So from High's point of view, from the wider kind of support network's point of view, what's out there to help businesses? Yeah, I I mean, just before I sort of go on to that, what's really struck me throughout all the industry experts that we've been speaking to over the last few weeks during these sessions is really that just the depth of understanding they have about their customers and visitors that are coming here, what they want, and really, really in touch with that. So... You know, again, the main resource, and uh, you know, I plug it week after week. But Tourism Intelligence Scotland, there's a specific walking guide that really covers, you know, what type of walkers are coming. Remember, walkers don't just walk; they they need, they want and have a desire to do other things. Whether it's enjoying the local crack in the pub in your village or town or city, going to visitor attractions having good food, different types of experiences where they can really just get steeped in the local culture. All the research is pointing towards that that's what people are looking for. So remember that walkers don't just walk. There is a bit more about the market in this book here, but wider than that, there's actually another guide, Knowing Your Markets, which um, again is pertinent to all the sort of topics that we've covered week after week. It will give you an idea of I guess you thinking about what your particular strengths are, and we talked earlier about unique selling points, and thinking about where you're really strong, and perhaps thinking is there perhaps a gap, or a a gap whether there's perhaps a product or service that you could build around the needs that the market is telling us it wants. Listening to our visitors, there's nothing more important than that, and listening to what feedback is telling you and then looking to see, acting on that as a suggestion for improvement. There's also a guide called Listening to Our Visitors, so I suggest you get all of these. You can get them on the website that's maybe behind me here, but if not, it will be noted later. But there's also, from a Highlands and Islands Islands perspective, we have got, if you're looking to sort of dabble and would like to get sort of more share of an international market, we have got products and programmes that we can offer you where they're, they're short and you can learn more knowledge and yeah lots of stuff out there lots of stuff out there I'm yeah, glad to see as ever we've got our <laughs> book we can't go a week without our TIS guide um, and it is as Audrey said tourism-intelligence.co.uk is the website address if you want to go on and download the guides um, I'm very conscious that today um, we had a big audience and we had lots of questions Um, What we will try to do is we'll maybe get uh, Helen and Gary to have a look at the chat box immediately after we're finished and maybe see if they can type in or we'll get somebody to type in some answers to the questions that we didn't manage to answer live on air um, because it would be nice to be able to round that off. We'll leave that chat up for at least the next 24 hours so if you want to log back in again and have a little look 
Um, some of Helen and Gary's responses will be in there to the questions that we weren't actually able to cover live. Um, as ever, a big thank you to Helen's and Isles Enterprise for sponsoring these events and also to Forestry Commission Scotland. And we'd also like to thank Scottish Tourism Alliance, Visit Scotland, Scottish Enterprise, Wild Scotland and Scottish Natural Heritage. Next week, we'll be looking at food and drink, which sounds interesting. Um, and for those of you who have gathered that I'm not the energetic type, like golf, this one sounds like it could be right up my street. So food and drink sounds like a good one. Uh, it also apparently influences 80% of visitors to Scotland on their decision about where to come. So we must be getting something right if all these people are coming for the food and drink. So make sure you tune in next week. Um, also, please remember, if you want to carry on the discussion on Twitter, it's hashtag HIE Tourism. Uh, you'll also have the glorious advantage of seeing our uh, staff's Movember efforts there from last week. Uh, worth, worth a visit for that, if nothing else. So we look forward to seeing you next week when we'll be looking at food and drink. That's at 9.30 next Wednesday. <laughs>